Good afternoon and welcome to our Timoney webinar this week on the future and meaning of work. My name is Ronan O'Farrell and I'm the CEO of the Timoney Leadership Institute, an educational charity. Our purpose? Better leaders, better organizations and a better society. Some of you will have seen a survey of CEOs reported in today's newspaper which reveals that some 90% of businesses expect some of their staff to continue to work remotely after the COVID-19 restrictions are, are lifted. And about a third are reconsidering their office needs as well, uh, presumably downsizing. Are these short-term trends or is this the beginning maybe of a, a seismic shift in the future of work? Will this lead to better organizations, a better working environment for employees? Also, you might say many of us have experienced these changes uh, in a way that they're asking more profound questions about finding meaning in our work. What is it that motivates me to get out of bed in the morning and, uh, and make it over to the kitchen table with the laptop communicating with a virtual world out there? Some big decisions have already been made by some people to pivot and to change the direction of their lives. And uh, here with me this afternoon to, to discuss some of these issues, we're privileged to have Dr. Vincent Ogutu, who before COVID came along at all, he had invested quite a bit of time and passion in understanding how we find meaning in our work. And importantly, understanding some of the keys to a fulfilling and meaningful life. Dr. Ogutu is the Vice Chancellor Designate of Strathmore University in Nairobi, Kenya. He's a teacher at heart and a great communicator as those of us who've, who've seen his TED talk and his recent video on, on future of work can uh, testify. He's also occupied various leadership roles in the development of Strathmore Business School, which like Timoney is one of the associate business schools of Yesse in Barcelona. His passion for sharing ideas that can transform lives is infectious and no doubt influenced uh, his choice of topic for his PhD in Reuters University in New Jersey, which focused on the psychology of meaningful work. So Vincent, delighted that you're joining us. Before we, we dive into the topic at hand, maybe I could ask you how, this pan how you're faring with this pandemic in, uh, in Kenya and, and specifically in, in Strathmore University. You seem to be, to be doing reasonably well. Thank you, Ronald. First of all, it's a privilege to be with all of you. I must mention that I did meet Timoney himself briefly in the 80s when he was making a trip to Tanzania. And I was a young student then, and I just wish I'd had time to I'd spend more time with him. It's such a privilege to finally be with the Timoney community, having met the founder ever so briefly. So, well, COVID has happened here as it did in Ireland. For the longest time, we thought it was something alien that was never going to come to Africa, that Africans couldn't even contract. There were all these theories that were being bandied about, but eventually it came and we found ourselves on lockdown, just like the rest of the world. I think we're lucky and we've been spared. We reacted very, very quickly. And as soon as the first case was announced, we went on lockdown. And I happened to be traveling back from Uganda just across the border when they made that announcement. So I had to self quarantine before everyone else did. And uh, that's how it's been. So we've had just about 200 deaths. And we're talking about our first case being in early March. So I think we've been largely spared. Part of it is because of the efforts we made right at the beginning to go on lockdown and to be very conservative about it. And I think we've just been blessed as well. I don't know what the reason is, if it's the weather, if it's COVID getting weaker with time, if it's the inoculations we had that people don't get in Europe anymore, who knows what the reason is. But we've definitely been spared. It could have been a lot worse looking at the projections we were seeing in March. In March. Very good, very good. And that's great news. That's uh, that's very. Hopefully, it'll stay that way now. <clears throat> yeah. Just a reminder to people: you can you can put questions, submit questions for Vincent in the Q and A box at uh, 
at the bottom of the screen. And indeed, you can upvote for questions too, in case you, we don't get to them all. Um, so Vincent, you, you were explaining to me yesterday that you grew up in Eastlands in Nairobi, which is a very poor part of the city. Now you're vice chancellor designate of Stratmore University. So what were the, the catalysts along the way to get you there? Gosh, that's a deep question. I guess it all started with my living in Eastlands, which in Kenya, everyone would understand. If you say you come from Eastlands, it's like saying in the US, you come from the hood, you know, you come from the ghetto and they expect you to be really rough. And, uh, and there are all, all sorts of assumptions they make about people who come from Eastlands. So I grew up there from a very good family. So dad and mom were outstanding. They give me a lot of freedom, but they explain to me what would happen if I misuse that freedom. So that allowed me to be friends with my friends, but at the same time, not get involved in some of the things they were getting involved in because it had been broken down to me. If you do that, this will affect your health, this will affect your studies and your future. And so I credit a lot of what I am now to just the upbringing that I got from my parents and from the schools that I went to. So the first school that I went to was a Catholic school in Eastlands called St. Teresa's. And we were talking about this yesterday, Ronan. Some of the people who took care of us there were Irish. So I remember Father Brady, who had a big influence in my life. And it's at that time that I got a scholarship to go to Strathmore, the high school. Because even though it, I'm in Strathmore University now, Strathmore started as an A-level uh, College of Arts and Sciences back in 1961. And it is to that college that I got admission and almost a full ride, which is what made it possible for me to even go there in the first place. My parents couldn't possibly have afforded to take me there. But living in Eastlands exposed me to poverty, to abject poverty. And I remember at one point, they wanted to gentrify the neighborhood right next to ours, which was a slum. People living in paper houses that looked like igloos. And so they just sent these trucks, these bulldozers that uprooted these uh, makeshift homesteads. And, and there were women screaming, children crying. And I just thought, what could I do for this never to happen again, ever? And so as I was growing up, I was thinking, what can I do to eradicate poverty, to just make sure this kind of misery doesn't happen again. So that inspired me to become an economist. So I studied economics in my undergrad in the naive belief that economists change the world, that if we had the right policies, poverty would go away. And around that time, the people who mentored me at Strathmore invited me to come back as a high school teacher they said, we know you're an idealist, you want to change the world. You could change it by being a leader yourself out there, but you'll only be a leader of one company, one corporation. That's it. We're giving you the chance to almost clone yourself, to inspire generations of kids to become leaders. So you'll have to take a back seat, not be in the front lines, but you know you're going to have an impact by just inspiring five to 10 kids every year. So that's what I did. Instead of practicing as an economist, I decided to invest in future leaders because it's the leaders who make the changes. It's the leaders who call the shots. It's not the economists. People might not pay attention or might not take heed of the advice that economists give them. Political leaders might even um, just use the economists to keep the economy looking fine as they do whatever they want to do. So I grew out of my naivety and I realized if I wanted to have an impact, it had to be in the domain of leadership. And as a teacher, I get the privilege to try and form future leaders all the time, as I did when I was teaching at the high school. And at the university, I have the opportunity to teach current leaders. So what I teach them today, in class today, they can put into practice tomorrow, the very next day, they can be making changes in the way they lead. So that's how my Eastland story weaves into where I am now. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you were sharing last week uh, a short video clip on LinkedIn about the future of work. 
and the skills that we'll need in, in this new world, uh, working from anywhere, technology skills and so forth. But thinking about leaders uh, of organizations who you're now teaching and, and indeed you are one yourself, uh, what skills would you highlight as being especially important uh, to be acquiring now? Okay, good question. And some of those skills are some of the ones I talked about in that video. Communication skills are so important and this has become clearer during COVID when you need to almost over communicate. Silence means nothing's happening or that you're clueless, you don't know what to do, and that sends a panic down the ranks. So you've got to communicate. Even if you're still thinking, you've got to say, we understand the problem, we've seen it, we've got a team working on it, we'll get back to you in a week's time or in two weeks' time. Even that provides some kind of relief, even though you might say, but I haven't said anything, really. I haven't given them the answers they were looking for. But it's still reassuring to talk to someone, to know that they're aware of the problem and to just know that they are working on it. So communication is a very, very big, uh, it's a big skill that we need to think about. Then emotional intelligence, because everything's happening so fast that it's easy to misunderstand each other, to flare up, to just make the situation worse. So you've got to have the ability to understand what people are really saying and to just have enough self-mastery not to snap at them, not to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, to just give it the benefit of the doubt sometimes, to even just let it go, to be ready to win the war, not the battle. This isn't a battle of wits where I have to win this particular uh, argument. You know, I'm looking at what's going to happen down the road. I need this person on my side, in this team, feeling motivated. That's much more important than winning this particular argument or proving my point or making them look small. So that combination of emotional intelligence and communication is so important right now and going forward. Then flexibility as well because in the past you had the luxury to just sit back and follow the protocol. This is what we said we should do in these situations and we have to take this to this committee and then that committee. And that's just too slow in this day and age and especially during the pandemic. We've had to just move super fast and to ask people to actually realize we can't wait and to set very quick deadlines and then to just tell people, make it happen. Because we need it to happen by tomorrow. Because if you don't have an answer by tomorrow, there might be a lawsuit. We might be facing lawsuits, the temperature's climbing. We've got to do something now. We don't have the luxury of waiting till next, next week's meeting. No, we've got to decide this either today or latest this afternoon, if you need more time to think about it. That takes a lot of flexibility. And I think that's something people have to acquire, the ability to, to just realize that the structures were made for us, not us for the structures. And if we have to put them aside in order to just look at the big picture and make that decision, then that's what we're going to do. If we have to fast track it and say, we need an answer sooner than we normally would get one, then that's what we do. And that requires a lot of flexibility. Very good. Yeah, very three very practical things there. I, I mentioned earlier in your research, Vincent, that into the meaning we find in our work, that you've focused on that. And I'll say that the pandemic has led many to pause and reflect on what, what's important in life. Um, maybe reconsidering the importance of relationships, family, friends, and so forth. So what, what advice would you have for leaders on, on following through on, on these important insights? about meaning? Well, a lot of people ask about meaning, that, that very word, like what, what is meaning anyway, you know? And does it mean purpose, significance? You know, there, there are so many ways of interpreting it. When I went into my studies that you just mentioned, I really didn't know what I wanted to do in my PhD. I knew, I knew that I wanted to understand leaders better 
because I thought leaders are the ones who can have an impact and, and solve the world's problems at scale. Their ability to have an impact is much bigger than just an individual doing their day-to-day -day work. And so I, I needed to understand what it is that leaders do to get people to move in a particular direction, to dedicate their best efforts for a particular goal. I needed to understand that. And I picked organizational behavior, which is really psychology applied to the workplace, to try and understand it better, like what motivates people? What are those buttons that leaders are pressing in order to get people to follow them? And then I got more fascinated by the followers themselves. What is it that was making them move? What attracted them to those leaders or to the messages that they were hearing? What motivates people? And I decided because it's a PhD, it's the only time in life you'll have the luxury of spending day after day after day just going as deep as you want on any question of your choice. I said I would go all the way. So we're not just going to look at what motivates people. I wanted to know and what's the best motivator of all those things out there that motivate people, which is, which is the best. And I ended up reading a book called Habits of the Heart. This is a book written by some sociologists in 1985, Robert Bella and his colleagues. Almost a, a rewrite of Tocqueville's book 150 years earlier, Democracy in America. So Tocqueville goes to America. He wants to understand why these people are so different from Europeans and yet they come from the same stock. What is it about them? And he wrote that book, Democracy in America, describing politics, religion, work, and so 150 years later, Robert Bella and the, his colleagues say, well, is America still the same? What makes us stick as a people? And they had all these fascinating chapters. What do Americans think about politics? What's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat in their worldview? And they looked at religion, you know, Catholics versus evangelicals, and then the Jewish factor coming in. But what fascinated me the most was the chapter on work because they said, what does work mean to people? Because it's very different. I mean, you're coming from Europe where there's a lot more uh, class in the whole topic of work. Certain kinds of work are regarded as higher than others. But then when you go to America, you'll find pretty much everyone boasting about having worked at the gas station, having worked at a McDonald's, having been a waiter, they say it with a lot of pride. So why that difference? You know, what, what does work mean to Americans compared to Europeans, compared to the rest of the world? And so in this chapter, they focused on the question of meaning. What does work mean to you? And they found that people tend to fall into three major categories. They're those for whom work is just a job. It is where they earn a living. It's all about survival and getting money. And in fact, uh, thank you, uh, Ali, for putting, putting that up. So in this category, you have people who work just to get the money. They need it. They're not looking for purpose in their work other than getting that money. All the purposeful, meaningful, interesting things that they want to do, they're going to do it outside of work. Whether it's travel and that's what they like doing, whether it's spending time with their families, you know, that's, that's what they're going to do outside of work. They don't necessarily expect to enjoy their work. It's just a means to an end. It's a means to get that money with which they can then go ahead and, uh, and, earn a, uh, and, and enjoy the other things that they want to do in life. And so I wanted you to take this little quiz and just read this particular text that we've put here, which describes those kinds of people. And then rate yourself. How similar are you to people like that? Do you work mostly for the money? It's about survival. And you tend to find meaning outside of work. You tend to find all the interesting things that you really want to do at the end of the day outside of work. The things that give you joy and fulfillment. You tend to find them outside of work. Work is just a pathway to those things by providing money. So are you like those people? If you're not at all like them, then you'll give yourself a one. If that's exactly who you are, 
like go no further, that's it. That's exactly why I work. I don't work for any other reason. Then you give yourself a seven. If we're, you're somewhere in the middle, somewhat like me, you know, not fully like me, you know, that'll be a, a four. And you have all those numbers in between. So just, I want you to take just a few, like a minute or less than a minute thinking about it. So I'll give you a few seconds to read that. Rate yourself and keep that number in your head or write it down. So 30 seconds to do that. Okay, so don't overthink it. Just go with your gut feel, whatever you think. Yeah, I'm a seven, I'm a one, I'm a two, whatever it is that, that you've got. So that's one group of people that uh, Robert Bella and, and colleagues found. And they call this a job orientation. So they have a job orientation towards their work. Now, this second category of people have what we call a career orientation. Just quickly describing it, these are people who think of their work as a means to get to a higher position, a higher station in life, to get recognition, for me to get promoted, to move from whatever I'm doing to supervisor, to manager, to general manager, to you know, CEO, then move to a bigger company and rise to CEO in that company. Just keep moving up the ladder. It's almost a, a, a status game where you're trying to get to the top and it's all about competition. You're competing with other people and you want to be number one. You want to be uh, king of the heap. You want to get to the top. That's what work is for you. It's basically a playing field. It's a competition. It's a league that you entered and you want to rise to the top and you measure your success by the, the level to which you succeed in getting to the top in, in rising in, in your organization. So let's do the same thing. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read that text. It's a description of career-oriented people. And then rate yourself. How similar are you to these people? Like to what extent? So don't say, oh no, I was a seven in, in the job orientation, so I can't be anything here. No, no, no. For every type of orientation will we'll be somewhere on that spectrum. So just give yourself a, a frank assessment. Where are you on this spectrum? So 30 seconds to do that. Okay, very good. So we'll now look at the, the third category that this book, Habits of the Heart, found. Now this category is labeled calling orientation. So these are people who work because they want to find fulfillment. They want to do something that makes them feel good after having done it, like I'm fulfilled when I do this job, it's interesting. That could be one of the main reasons why they're doing it. Another major reason that they could be doing it is because they think it will make a difference, either in other people's lives or on the planet. They have this tremendous sense of meaning and purpose. Their work is what actually fulfills them. They feel very happy about what they do and the impact that it has. So again, ask yourself, to what extent am I like these kinds of people? And these are answers that you should record, just uh, answering James on the chat. Just, it's gonna be useful for you to decode yourself, to understand yourself and what makes you do the things that you do. And we're going to have a poll after this. So that's why I want you to remember how you rated yourself. But right now, the main point of the exercise is to help you understand what triggers, what, what makes you find meaning, or what kind of meaning do you find at your workplace? Is it the money? 
Is it the position, the status, or is it the impact and the sense of fulfillment? You know, what is it? But you'll have a little bit of each. Let's see how much. So once again, rate yourself for category C, to what extent are you a calling oriented person? And be very, very frank and sincere with yourself because that's the only way you'll make the most of what I'm going to say next. So 30 seconds to do that. Okay, so I think by now you have a rough idea where you fall on the job, career, calling spectrum. No one's the same as anyone else. Each of us is unique and we have a different combination. You might have a lot more of one, a little less of the other, but one of them generally tends to dominate. So you'll find that one of them will be higher than all the rest. It's very rare to get somebody who's got an equal highest score for two of the categories. It is possible. It's not impossible. It's just rare. And if that happens, I can help you interpret that as well. But I think for most of us, one of those categories will take the lead, in which case we'll actually categorize you as belonging to that group of people. We'll say, oh, you're a job-oriented person or you're a career-oriented person, or you are a calling-oriented person. So having done this exercise, I'd like us to now take a poll just to understand, you know, what were you most like? This time I'll actually force you to choose. What were you most like? And even if you had maybe two that were almost the same, at this point I want you to I want to force an answer from you. Which one do you think really, really captures what you're looking for in a job? Like what you're definitely not ready to let go of. If that was taken away, then it wouldn't be worth it anymore. So force yourself to be in one of these three categories. For most of you, you don't even have to force yourself. You'll already be in one of them as your highest. So go ahead and take the poll. So we'll give you 20 seconds to get it right and, and submit. So the three questions that are being asked here, person A, job orientated, working for the money. Person B, career orientated, working for status. And person C, calling orientated, working for fulfillment and to make a difference. Right, so you're going to be in one of those three positions. So, Alison, I guess you've got the answers for us. You can read them out, Ronan. Okay, so person A, that's 17%. And person B, 17% as well. And person C, 66%. So the majority of our, our uh, attendees today are in that category. Okay, fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for taking the poll. We had a conversation about this yesterday and this is kind of what I predicted that if your leaders and according to the age group that Ronan described that I could expect to come, people who've taken these leadership courses at Timony, you're probably at that point in your life where you're comfortable. So it's not really about the money. That's not your main concern you've probably reached the highest position in your organization or pretty high up. So maybe it's no longer about status and, you know, getting to the top. So now it's a question of what do I want to leave behind? What sort of a legacy do I want to, to have as a leader? That's the kind of concern that you have. You're now looking for almost existential meaning. As I come closer to the end of my life, what do I want to be remembered for? And during COVID, I think it's, we've been forced to think about it. Personally, just when we went into lockdown and I was trying to understand how things could play out, and I'm, I'm sure you've done this as well, you've gone into scenarios. 
hopefully not just for your organization, but even for yourself. Have you done any scenarios for your life? And I had to ask myself, you know, I, I'm pretty healthy, I'm in good shape, I run. But yes, I do have allergies, which manifest in the respiratory system. So I thought maybe I'm at risk. Maybe I could be gone in two weeks time. In which case, what should I get done between now and then? Because it's a real possibility. So if I'm going to be dead in two weeks time, have I done what I need to get done in life? Have I said what I need, needed to say? Have I asked for forgiveness wherever I needed to do that? Have I reached out to people? Um, what would I do? And I had to simulate it in my head. So I assumed it wouldn't be so fast that I wouldn't have time to think. I gave myself probably five days before it deteriorates to a point where I can't think anymore or act anymore. So I just told myself, if I get the symptoms, then I'll know I, I have five days to give away my passwords, <laughs> you know, my bank account, maybe even make the transfer so they don't have to try proving that they were in my estate and they need to get the money and, you know, just have it all done. Yeah. So I went through all of that. But of course, the, the deepest question was, how did I live my life? Am I proud of how I live my life? And uh, in my case, I could see a lot of things that I didn't get done that I should have. All the gifts I was given that I should have used better. But thankfully, I've always been moving in the general direction I should be moving. So at least I couldn't fault myself on that and say I went in the direct opposite direction. Mm -hmm. That isn't the case. So at least I have that luxury of saying I was always kind of moving in the right direction. But uh, maybe, I, I mean, I definitely know I could have done better. I could have done a lot better, but hey, I only have two weeks. So how do I maybe capture the best of what I have and turn it over to somebody who will write about it and, and share all those nuggets, all those unwritten books? <clears throat> how can I package it so fast that I get those ideas out? So those are the kinds of things that went on in my mind. Uh, Ron, I mean, I was thinking of legacy and the, the very real possibility of dying soon. And with that, I mean, I suppose as time goes on, we, we can lose that perspective again that we've, we've perhaps picked up where you, you, you look at the legacy and you look at, at the things that really matter, the, as I think you, you refer to it as imperishable crowns versus perishable ones uh, that we seek out in, uh, in life. Um, so what, what imperishable ones would you be recommending for leaders? I think the most imperishable crowns have to do with people. Mm. Everyone's here. Everyone here is familiar with, with uh, you know, Steve Jobs' last statement, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. You know, so much as you're a leader and people would expect you to talk about your legacy from a corporate context, this is what I achieved. I took the company to the heights. I took them to a multi-million euro dollar company kind of thing. You know, that's not what's going to give you the greatest satisfaction. You're going to end up coming back to the basics. How did you treat people? Starting with those closest to you, your family, and then moving on to those who work for you. You referenced my video, Ron, and the one we shot at Strathmore, talking about the future of work. Probably the greatest comment that I've had on that video has nothing to do with the future of work. It was just an aside. I was walking through the garden of the university and this guy was just filming me and, and telling me, just say some random stuff, you know, about this particular place. So I started talking about the trees. I love the terminalia around here. And then I cast my eyes in a certain direction where one of our employees who just shines shoes in the morning to people who show up to work. And I said, oh, I miss the shoe shine guy. I wonder what he's doing during COVID right now. And then I just thought, oh, that's insensitive to call him the shoe shine guy and he's got a name. So then I paused and said, Peter, well, you know, life, that, that's how it is. And, and, you know, he actually put it in the video. It has nothing to do with the future of work. 
And that's the, that's the comment that's attracted the most attention to that video because people said, oh, you remembered his name? The shoeshine guy? Like, wow, isn't that amazing that you would remember someone at the very bottom of the pyramid, the one who shines shoes for people, that you remember that. That's what they appreciated the most. They thought it was very cool talking about uh, creativity and flexibility and all those other interesting things. But the one that really touched their hearts was how do you treat people? How do you relate to people? Do you see them as human beings? Do you see them as equals? Are you rooting for them? Are you worried about what's going to happen to them during COVID? Or are you just looking at the bottom line? That's the only thing you're thinking about. So I think one of the things as leaders that we have to think about if you want to have a legacy is did you do those little things? Did you reach out to people? Did you sincerely care? Because we can also do it by paying lip service to it. But I, I think people have like a sixth sense. They'll know if you're genuine or not. If you're actually patronizing, you're just reaching out, but you know, you're like reaching down, almost you're like reaching down from your throne, from your high, high throne, down to the plebs, the ordinary people. No, they should see you treating them as an equal, somebody you're genuinely concerned about. And just today, one of our employees who's one of the waitresses has lost her dad. And so we get this email from uh, our human resource, we call it people and culture at Strathmore. So we get, you know, bereavement. So I always dread seeing that title mm. in the email. Mm. And obviously you could just click on it and say, oh, well, another one. And I've been getting one every week. I don't know if it's COVID, I don't know what it is. But there's been, and I always dread it when I see an, an email beginning with the title bereavement. Of course, the temptation is just to not read it or out of curiosity to just see who is it? Could it be somebody I know? And then you could almost immediately answer that question. Oh, I don't know who that person is because we've got a thousand employees. So I don't know all of them by name. It's easy to just move on. But I just said, look, it's only going to take me two minutes. So I sent that email. I'm so sorry to, for your loss with you in, in prayer, anything we can do for you. And uh, she replied almost immediately. So I wrote almost immediately. I probably was one of the first people to respond to that email. It had just come in, maybe five minutes later, I'd written to her. And then she wrote back and saying, thank you so much. It means so much to me that you reached out. You know, just the little things. Those are the things, surprisingly, that you'll be remembered for. It might not be that, you know, you were the one who made this organization double in revenue or whatever it is. It'll just be, how did you treat people? What sort of a culture did you leave in, in place? And surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, when you do that, you actually get all that other stuff you're looking for. So is it loyalty you're looking for from your employees? You'll get it. Is it engagement? You want them to, you know, just work hard to get the organization out of the woods, even work for less? They'll do it if you inspire loyalty. And you can't do it as some kind of game that you're playing. Almost like, oh, now I know the buttons to press, so I'll just press them and I'll get what I want. It has to be genuine. And people, like I say, have a sixth sense. They can detect if you're acting, just play acting, or if you're genuine. And if you are genuine, I think they'll do anything for you. They'll work really hard. They'll almost work for free and you will succeed. And they'll keep bringing you the best ideas because they're thinking about how to make you succeed, how to keep this organization afloat because it deserves to be, because they like you, because they want this kind of thing to continue. They find that they're understood at their place of work and they can't find this anywhere else. It's something precious, they want to keep it. So if you're looking for a legacy, I think the first question you should ask yourself is how do I impact people? How do I impact my employees? How do I impact my customers? How do I impact the community that our organization is embedded in? What difference do we make? 
And how can I do things in such a way that it makes a difference? So that's what I would recommend, Ronan. Fantastic, fantastic, well done. Well, on that, obviously, having that strong sense of meaning as a leader and, and conveying that to others, are there ideas you can share about helping employees or colleagues to, to share in that meaning or to discover a similar one for themselves? Um, it's a lot about, first of all, being genuine, experiencing it, and then giving them a taste of it. Because if you're just talking about it, then this is what we've seen so often. You come out with a strategy, but it's just words. And then you talk about values. This, these are the core values of our organization. And you've got even a, a poster or a banner, you know, it's, it's up there, it's all over the place in every PowerPoint. Everyone has to speak to it or at least, you know, tip their hat to it. But if it's not actually lived, then you won't communicate it. So the best way to communicate meaning is by genuine engagement, by actually giving them a taste for what it's like. Like this is, this is what it looks like. So even that video that you talked about of the future of work, one of the comments I got from a friend in the US is he said, I like the fact that you were demonstrating the skills as you talked about them. Now, I didn't realize I was doing that. It's just with hindsight and looking at his observation, I said, oh gosh, was I doing that? I didn't set out to do that. But hey, maybe that's why it had such a huge impact and had like 20,000 something people seeing it within a few days. It's because as I spoke about something, I was also demonstrating. I would talk about creativity while walking into that open space in the business school and just saying how we can use that space in so many different ways. And I was actually demonstrating how creativity works and saying no excuses. Don't tell me you don't have resources to get the job done. Just reconfigure whatever you already have and make it serve your purpose. And that's creativity. And when I was talking about emotional intelligence, I just give an example of what I'd do with a student in a class if they were disengaged. First of all, spotting that they're disengaged and then finding ways to engage them and then showing how that then uh, works with communication. You have to have a communication strategy after you understand what's going on, after you read the situation, which means you have to have the ability to read the situation, to understand what others are seeing and what you're seeing. And when you have the full picture, you can now craft your communication strategy. So it was a question of demonstrating it as you go along. So if you want to have an impact, then you've got to demonstrate it. So if you say this is going to be a priority, whatever it is that you're making a priority, whether it's paying attention to little details, whether it's on-time performance, whether whatever it is, you know, better communication, you've got to immediately show that you're concerned about it. The very next statement you make the very next meeting that you have, you're pointing out things that show that this is on top, this is a top of mind issue for you. You're constantly thinking about it. And everything you do has to basically show that you're serious and then they'll believe you and now you can actually communicate. it. So a lot of it is not communicating in the sense of words. What are the best words to use in order to convey meaning? It's experiential. If I want them to do things in order to change the world, to shift their focus from the bonus to changing the world, then I've got to show genuine concern for changing the world. I've got to make some sacrifices. They've got to see my skin in the game and then they'll say, oh, he's serious. And it's a question of inspiring as well you're trying to inspire and inspiration doesn't just come with words. It's with that sixth sense where they detect that this person means it. And they actually have data that they're using. I'm sure this person means it because I see him or her doing this, doing that, doing that, which is consistent with someone who claims that this is a goal for them. So if you want to communicate meaning, action speaks louder than words. That's, that's, that's the kind of language you want to, to use actions rather than words. And words. Very good, very good. Well, thank you for that. I will go to some some questions. Uh, 
Is it possible to change orientation at different stages of one's career? Very good question, and I had to answer that in my dissertation. I, I really wanted to know, are we born into one of those three buckets and that's where we're going to be for the rest of our lives? Or is it something that can change? And what I found is there's a very small category of people who claim that they had a calling right from the get-go. For as long as they can remember, they always felt that they were, they were there to fulfill a higher purpose and they knew, they kind of knew what it was. That was a very small percentage. And then there was another very fascinating group of people who discovered their calling in a day, in a flash. And I remember when I was interviewing them, they'd get emotional. And I would ask them, could you just take me through what happened that day and the precise moment when it's like the scales fell off their eyes and they said, now I see it. Now everything makes sense. Everything I've ever done was building up to this moment and preparing me for the mission of my life, which I now understand and I'm so happy to have, to have reached here. That was also a very small group of people. The majority by far were just meandering, searching, but it's like they had a homing instinct that kept, kept telling them, this isn't it. I just know it isn't it, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'm pretty sure this isn't it. What I'm doing now is not it. And then they'll move to something else that they think will give them whatever it is they're looking for, which they don't know. And they'll say it's better, but it's still not the definitive place. And then they just kept shifting and moving until just like the ones who learned it dramatically and switched in a day, they actually finally have clarity and say, this is it, this is my calling. So maybe the metaphor that works best for me when I'm describing that process is, uh, and for this you'd need to be old enough to have seen the old cameras I certainly am old enough to, to remember that, you know, that whole idea of the zoom and zooming in and that whole concept of, you know, first of all, you have to point the camera in the right direction. When you have no clue what your calling is, you don't even know where to look. You're all over the place. And then at a certain point in your life, you stop looking in certain directions. You're saying, I know for sure it cannot be in such and such a sector because I hate that, or it just rubs me the wrong way. I know, you know where, where not to look. So at least you're now pointing the camera in the right direction. And when you're pretty sure you know what the general outlines of your calling is, you now begin to do what I call zooming in. Personally, I'm at that stage where I'm definitely pointing the camera in the right direction. And you might think I've arrived and there's nothing more for me to see. But hey, every two or three years, I get the sensation that I've zoomed in further and I have much greater clarity than I ever had before. And whatever new mission I've been given is consistent with all the things I've done previously, is still on the same path, mm -hmm. but is exactly what I needed to do right now and it's where I can have the greatest impact. So to your question, John, uh, you're not locked in wherever you are. And unfortunately, you can lose your calling too. You can get disillusioned and just say, well, the world isn't the way I thought it was. People aren't who I thought they were and forget it. From now on, I'm just thinking about myself and forget about saving the world. That can happen, unfortunately. Let's hope it doesn't happen to you and that you keep experiencing what I'm experiencing, which is just zooming in further and further and further. Which doesn't mean it gets easier, by the way. Because sometimes, and you'd asked me this question earlier, Ron, and maybe I dodged it when you said, how did I end up being vice chancellor designate of Strathmore? Well, they coerced me to do it. This wasn't part of the plan. I wasn't planning to be the president of a university because I felt I was in a good place. I knew what I wanted in life. I wanted to teach because I could see the power in that, the ability to inspire people. And then I wanted to just engage with people in the community, pick all kinds of problems and then work it out with them and say, how can we as scholars bring research to bear on these problems 
and then solve yet another problem and another and another and another. And I could do this for the rest of my life. So why did I need to take on the problems of other people and be a decision maker in an organization and be where the buck stops? Why would I want to do that when my life was made? I'd already seen my calling. So why would I want to, to do this? And they told me, why are you saying no? And I said, because I already can have the impact I want to have. And they said, but we're giving you an opportunity that's consistent with your calling. We're giving you the opportunity to have impact at scale. You're just trying to do your own thing, which is a lot of fun. You go to prisons, you help them find meaning. Then you'll talk to terminally ill patients, they'll help them find meaning. Then you'll just talk with youths and about talents and you know talent jobs of the future. It's all very exciting for you, but you want to work in a perfect university that allows people like you to do whatever they want to do. But you don't want to help us create that kind of a university. Now imagine how far you could get if you step back from the front line, exactly the same pitch they gave me to join the, the high school when I was supposed to be working for PricewaterhouseCoopers and Nation Media Group, I already had contracts, just hadn't signed. And they said, it's much better to invest in making others to become leaders than in being a leader yourself. So they knew it worked. They made the same pitch and that's what I did. Hmm. So that's how I ended up where I am. So John, it can keep changing but hopefully you'll be homing in. You'll be getting deeper and deeper into the line that you want to, uh, to get into. Okay, Vincent, I'll go to, to another live question, uh, which is from Margaret Considine, a uh, good friend. So Margaret, great to hear you. Hello, Ronan. And uh, Vincent, very nice to talk to you today. Your, your speech has been inspiring. So my question to you is, with all that you have done and all of your research, could you give us an idea of how we demonstrate the qualities of a, le a leader of tomorrow? What qualities do we need to be the leader for tomorrow? To create followers, to change our world. Okay. I'd already talked about communication. Yes. The need to constantly be in touch with uh, the leaders under you and the your employees to give them a sense of direction where you're going. And because things are happening so fast, it's not like the past where you could give your annual speech and that's it, then you just walk away. The situation's changing rapidly. And so they want to know what are we doing now? What preparations do we have in place now? So you're going to have to communicate a lot more than before. And then people might ask, but I'm not a good public speaker. I'm not a good communicator. Does that mean I can't be a good leader? And I have an answer for you. If the answers you're giving them are your best answers and they're genuine, that's all you need to communicate. It's not a question of how eloquent you are. It's a question of, is what you're saying making sense? Have you put your best thoughts and preparation into whatever path that you're offering to them? Are you investing in it yourself? Are you playing mind games with them? Are you holding back and trying to manipulate them? Or is this it, you know, like they say, the truth shall set you free. So do you come across as genuine? And that, I haven't talked about values, but I think values- That's where I was coming to. <laughs> right, values are a big part of winning trust. Because when you look at trust, why do people trust others? It comes down to two things. They'll trust you if you're competent, so they believe you know what you're talking about. You, you, you understand the industry, you have the experience, you have the wisdom, etc. So that's one thing that can win you trust. But then there's trust on another dimension, which is more to do with integrity and honesty. Because you could be so clever, you understand the industry so well, that you could actually manipulate us and get whatever it is you're trying to to get done, but you don't really care about us. So there's that element of trust that responds to integrity. And so if you want people to trust you, then you've got to come across as genuine, not just come across, you have to be genuine. And that really is talking about values. So I think values are, are a big thing. And if I may run on what I understand by values 
is they are deep beliefs that control the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. They're just so powerful that you can't, once you embrace a particular value and it is part of you, like hard wiring, it just won't allow you to do certain things because that's just like so against everything I stand for. I couldn't possibly do that. And that's why, for instance, if it's, let's say, a piece of machinery from Germany, you don't expect it to have been made in a sloppy way. You know, you just look at it, it's not even straight, it's not working, it's just breaking down. And you just won't believe any workshop in Germany could have released something like that to the market. Why? Because of embraced efficiency and excellence into their national core values and, and it's a lived value. Or if it's Japan, there are certain things they wouldn't do because it goes against their honor. Sadly, that's why you might even have suicide there because that's their way of restoring honor because I, I let down the family or I let down the organization and I've got to take the blame and responsibility on myself rather than on them. The only way to make it right again is to take my life. I mean, it's, it's insane, but that's how powerful values can be. They can make you do certain things or not do certain other things. Now, if you have a few core values as a leader that you embrace, that become a way of life for you, that'll win you so much credibility and so much trust which then allows you to navigate uncertain situations like COVID, which is happening right now, because you don't really have the answers, do you? You're, you're still figuring it out, but somebody's got to take the helm and keep everyone calm as you're trying to figure it out. Who's gonna do that? Somebody who inspires trust. How are you gonna inspire trust? By having values that are declared, that are lived, everyone can see it, you don't have to be a TV star, you know, a, a very eloquent person. You just have to, to be good and let it be seen. And that will, will get you where you want to get to. Well, look, Vincent, thank you very much. That's a very good and strong note to, uh, to end our webinar today. We've reached the, the time. Thank you very much for sharing those insights and to, to the various people who asked questions as well. We didn't get to them all and I've uh, a whole page of more questions I wanted to ask, so we'll just have to get you back. <laughs> but um, hopefully, maybe even uh, have you here come to Ireland in person at uh, at some point in the in the near future. So thank you very much, uh, Vincent, for that and for those insights. And congratulations on the the wonderful work you're doing uh, for Kenya and uh, and in Strathmore uh, as well. Next week, we'll be wrapping up the series of webinars that we started at the beginning of, of the lockdown, uh, which we started to help alumni and leaders to, to respond positively to, to the challenges. Um, we were partly encouraged to, uh, to start these webinars by seeing how useful uh, the SA Business School webinars were for their alumni. And uh, in fact, Many of them were hosted by Professor Mike Rosenberg, who's Professor of Practice of Management at uh, Yesse Business School. So he is going to join me for our final webinar next week. It'll be at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, the 24th of June. And I look forward to, uh, to having him then and focusing on managing in the new normal and seeing uh, how we can be proactive in that way in the months ahead. So thank you very much for joining us, for your questions, your interest. And in the meantime, stay safe and have a great day. Thank you.